Hello everyone. I am Ramji, coordinator, Raja Balayam, Rajiv College, Nature Club, and welcome to today's national level webinar, Avian and Reptiles of Indian Peninsula. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. Please mute your audio and video. You have the for clarity clarification. Any queries at the end of the session by raising your hand option in webinar. You can clarify your queries at the end of the session. In between, please don't raise your hands, please, because the recording is going on. So participants, please cooperate with us. Due to some technical problem, due to some technical problems, it is uh, Zoom may disconnect. If it disconnects, please rejoin with the same meeting ID and password. In case the Zoom is disconnected, please rejoin using the same meeting ID and password. Okay, now session starts now. Good morning, everyone. Is the time? Is our humble request to follow in the instruction for this webinar session. The link for the webinar meeting ID and password should not be shared. Please mute your audio and video. Please don't interrupt during the session. Now I call upon Mrs. Vinita, Department of Commerce, Assistant Professor, to give a welcome address and the introductory speech. Good morning to all present here. It's a great honor for me to welcome you all on this occasion. We have around 50 participants as of now from all over the world. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce the chief guest of today, who is a very high reputed person. I welcome the Nature Club coordinator, Mr. Ramji. And the chief guest of today is Dr. Essa Ganesh, Deputy Director and Scientist, Chennai Snake Park. He's the resource person of today's oh, yeah. level. Yeah. Hello, I'm Vinita Ma'am, are you there? Vinita Ma'am? Yes, sir, can you hear me, sir? Yeah. Madam, continue, continue, madam, continue, ma'am. Okay, okay. Dr. Ganesh is a high-profile person with research interest in documenting species richness of underexplored biomes with respect to South Indian hepatofauna through field expeditions, study of museum specimens, and mapping. Sir has undertaken field works at various places like Coromandel Coastal Plains, Deccan Plateau, Western Ghats, Eastern Ghats, etc. He has also visited University of Peradaniya, Sri Lanka to deliver a lecture on Western Ghats hepatofauna and Swedish Herpetological International Symposium. Sweden. Sir has collaborations with various organizations such as Agumbe Rainforest Research Station, Kalinga Center for Rainforest Ecology, Center for Ecological Sciences, etc. in India, and Society for Southeast Asian Hepatology, Germany, George Washington University, USA, etc. Sir has served in various capacities such as an assessor in Zoological Society London as journal reviewer for many international journals and also as contributor to EMBL Reptile Database, Amphibia Web, iNaturalist.org. He has also published about 75 articles in peer-reviewed national and international journals. Sir has many awards and accolades to his credit. Some of them are Young Achiever Award, Outstanding Performer Award, 
Distinguished Research Accomplishment Award, etc. We feel happy to inform you that Sir is a gold medalist in his MSc Wildlife Biology and he's a versatile orator with proficiency in many languages such as English, Tamil, Hindi, Malayalam, Telugu, Kannada and Konkani. We are very happy to have you Amit sir. sir. Now the session is yours sir. Thank you sir. Thank you Anita ma'am. Thank you. Dear participants, the session starts now. Sir, Sir Ganesan sir, can you able to hear me? Yes, yes I am. Okay, go ahead sir. The session is on your hand. Welcome sir, welcome. Thank you. Nice to meet all of you virtually on this webinar. We are going to take a brief look at the reptiles and amphibians of India. I'm going to draw a sketch on what is the diversity of this region so pathology is like and I'll be happy to take questions if any in the end. Right. I hope everyone can see the slides. Can everyone be audible and can you be able to view the site? Please message. Please chat. Please text in chat. Okay, sir. Everyone can be able to view, sir. Right. Okay. First is to know the uh, natural history or the animals in question. How do we recognize an animal as, uh, say, an amphibian or a reptile? What characters define or characterize an amphibian or a reptile? This is what we are going to deal with now. To begin with, amphibians and reptiles are primitive early vertebrates. They evolved from fishes and they gave rise in turn to other higher vertebrates such as birds and mammals. In amphibians, they have a naked skin, which means they do not have any covering over their skin. As we all know, fishes have scales, reptiles also have scales, birds have feathers, and mammals have fur. Amphibians is one of the few groups which do not have any such external integumentation covering over them. Right? Amphibians are also one of the few vertebrates which have a very elaborate metamorphosis or developmental pathway. Some of the amphibians, as can be seen in the picture in the slide, do have uh, an egg-laying face, whereas others have a free-swimming tadpole stage, right? They have a big and elaborate metamorphosis, something similar to what we already know of from insects, the most famous of which is the silkworms, right? And coming to reptiles, that, that's evolved. That, yes. yes? Yes, sir, I have called you kindly to pick up my call, sir, for to admit to some reason, sir. I called you. I called you. Hello? Admit all, huh? Uh, more. Show grid to be able to Participation. Ah, participants click on ah, okay. Admit all. Okay, okay, I'll click on Carry on, sir. Carry on, sir. Sorry for interruption. Okay. 
um, reptiles, on the other hand, evolved from amphibians. So they are subsequent to amphibians in the evolutionary history. Recalling my previous talk, reptiles have scales. I told that a, a, a few a while ago, and but their scales are quite different from those of fishes, in the sense scales of reptiles are much more epidermal. That is. They are quite attached only to the topmost layer of the skin and do not have much involvement to the actual skin itself. That enables the reptiles to shed their skin quite periodically and snakes do it so dramatically that it is all too obvious for us to take note of. Reptiles are mainly bisexual, which is the case with most other uh, vertebrates. That is, they have a separate male and female in each species. And most reptiles lay eggs particularly in tropical countries like India. And the incubation period of reptile eggs takes around two months or so. The temperature should be around 25 degrees for the eggs to hatch. And it will take two more months for them to develop fully. Right? So with this primer about the natural history and biology of reptiles, we move on to subsequent slides. Okay, now about the region that we are talking about, the Indian Peninsula. As we know, it is pretty much the whole of our country, but except, excepting, the, expect, excepting the part that is in the far north, say the Himalayan ranges or the Thar Desert or the northeastern states or the Andaman Nicobar Islands. So excluding this region, the remaining whole part of central and southern India is what we call as the Indian Peninsula. As can be seen from the map, we have we have a few places named which give you the information on most of the major mountain ranges and rivers in the region. Right? Indian Peninsula was not in the place where it is now. Long time ago, it drifted and collided with the Asian plate. It was part of the supercontinent Gondwana several million years ago close to 65 million years to be very precise. So that collision with the Asian mainland plate actually gave rise to the Himalayan mountains. That's why we call them as young pole mountains. Uh, and Western Ghats and Eastern Ghats, which have already been there in the peninsula of India, are far older geologically when compared to the Himalayan mountains. Right. So. With a long coastline and with a lot of uh, mountain ranges and rivers, this is a very complex and heterogeneous landscape. Okay, so just to give you a glimpse of what kind of habitats one can look for in Indian Peninsula, right from the coast all the way to the mountain tops, we have a several array of habitats, each of them arranged and graded into its own unique ecoregions. We have the coastal plains, we have the coastal scrub belt, we have the mangrove swamps in some places, we have thorn forests and scrub forests in the plains, we have dry deciduous forests, we have moist deciduous forests, and we have riparian forests along the river courses, and we have the tropical evergreen forests, and on the mountain tops, we have what is called as the Shola grassland forests or the mountain forests. So it is this heterogeneity of habitats which support a very vast uh, and diverse array of bio biota. Okay, now to give you a glimpse of uh, who are the people on whose shoulders we are standing now and looking at the picture of Indian Kapitopana. Mainly, uh, as we all know, binominal nomenclature was introduced and pioneered by Carlos Linnaeus. So his picture is on the first, followed by that of uh, followed by that of Patrick Russell. He was a Scottish doctor. He came from Scotland. 
and he was stationed in Vishakapatnam in Andhra Pradesh. He made one of the first and foremost of studies on Indian reptiles and he documented close to 42 species. So he's published his work in 1790s and later on many of the collections of his snakes were described and scientifically named using scientific names by John Gottlob Schneider whom we see to the next and then next is George Shaw and then next is Leschenault and then we have Dumeril and Bibron in the second row followed by George Scuvier. These are all French people. So as we know French territories and colonies were present in India in the past and during the late, I mean during late 1790s and early 1800s, these scientists did a lot of work and collections on reptiles and amphibians in India. And then comes Thomas Caverhill Jordan, the last person in the second, second row. He is from uh, England and he studied Indian reptiles. In 1854, he published a catalog of reptiles of British India, which is one of the first treatises to this region's herpetology. And in the last row, we have big names like uh, Gunther, Bowlinger, Annandale, Wall, and Smith. Most of them are English people, and they were associated with museums such as the Natural History Museum in London, the Zoological Survey of India in, in Bengal, which was started by Nelson Annandale, and then we have Frank Wall and M.A. Smith. So these are people who did field work in countries including India as well as in other countries such as uh, in Thailand Peninsula for Smith and uh, Frank Wall who worked extensively in Sri Lanka. So it is the cumulative work of many of these gentlemen which in turn has eased or enabled later researchers like me to start out. Right, so now to the first slide. This is called a Sicilian. As we all know, it looks like a worm or it, it looks like a snake. So just the fact that it doesn't have limbs is not going to make it either a snake or a, or a nutworm. It is an amphibian. This is called a Sicilian. These are some of the most primitive of all living amphibians. And these are burrowing animals which live underground in marshy and slushy substratum. So when we go to forests and dig down and around, around rivulets, we will get to... Yes. This is how it looks in the wild. More or less slaty brown color that serves to camouflage the species well. And the underside or the sides may be contrastingly colored with or without the yellow stripe. We have close to a two dozen species or so in India. Many more are being discovered and described every now and and so the anurans that are the frogs and toads we have a humongous diversity of frogs in India and we can confidently say that so the first family that we are going to see is the buffonids which are the true toads we have several genera of toads some of them are endemic to this region like the pedostibus are the Gatophryne. And then we have the Datophrynus, which is which was used usually previously known as the two four. Right? So many of these toads have uh, a single gular vocal sac, and these toads have a very warty skin which serves to identify them immediately. Many of the toads that live in our country are found in evergreen forests especially in the Western Ghats. Some like the tim micro tympanum, the Datafrenus micro tympanum, the Datafrenus pariatalis, these are species which are endemic to Western Ghats. Okay. Right, so this is to show you a glimpse of what the Indian toads look like. We have Pedostibus tuberculosis, which is the Malabar uh, tree toad, and then we have the Gatophrine, which is the torrent toads, and we have all the Datafrenus species. Curiously, one species, Datafrenus hololius, 
is the toad, which is kind of restricted. Its range is restricted only to the dry zone, the dry rocky scapes of India, which is quite unique for an amphibian. In other, in other taxa like reptiles, we have a highly pronounced endemism in the Indian dry zone, but in, but in amphibians, it's pretty much tending towards the west, the western guards, whereas this species, the Edathophrenus cololius, is quite unique in it being one of the few range-restricted amphibians that are found in Indian peninsula. And then we go to microhylids. Microhylids are so-called because of their very narrow mouth or snout. In colloquial terms, they're called as narrow-mouthed frogs or small-mouthed frogs. We have several genera such as Microhyla, Leuperodon, and there is one endemic genus called Melanobatracus. This uh, family of frogs in peninsular India, they, they can be easily identified by one important character, that their tympanic membrane or the eardrum will be invisible externally. So if we look at a frog and we do not get to see its tympanum, most likely we are looking at a microhylid frog. This is to show you some pictures of live microhylids. This is how they all look, very beautiful and colorful frogs. And the one in the middle, the black, dark, bluish one in the middle with postular warty skin, that is the Melanobatracus syndicus, the endemic subfamily and genus of microhylid in Indian Peninsula. It's found in Western Ghats, mainly in the southern parts of Western Ghats. And then we move on to Rachophorids, which are tree frogs. This is perhaps the most uh, diverse of all vertebrates in Western Ghats. There is one genus called Rawarchistus, which as you can see from the flight, is, is represented by more than 50 species. So all of them are endemic. And we have a primarily Sri Lankan group called the Shidophyllotus, and we have endemic genera of Western Ghats uh, Rachophorids, such as the Mercurana, the Benomic Salus, and the Gartic Salus. Two widespread species, genera such as Rachophorus, which is predominantly also found in Southeast Asia, also occurs in the Western Ghats. And of course, our common tree frog, the Polypedes maculatus, is also a part of this family. This uh, family of frogs can be easily identified by its horizontal pupil. So the pupil of this family of frogs is horizontally elongated, much like that of a goat, and hence can be quite simple to identify, right? So the ventral part or the underside of the skin will be largely granular, which is quite smooth in most frogs, but in this group, it's quite granular and rough. That is one more character. And most of the arboreal forms, right? So these are species which lives on trees and plants. And in, so, in some species, such as the Rachophorus, you have extensive webbings between the digits, that is, both in the forelimb and in the hind limb. This is to show you some pictures of uh, bush frogs, raw warchesters. Many of these, what you see in the picture, are found only in one or two nearby mountains. When we cross the valley and go to the next mountain, we look, we look at uh, different species of bush frog. So that is what is contributing to uh, the regional diversity a lot. We call it as beta diversity, right? So a lot of local endemism within the Western Ghats is a very typical feature. And frogs, more than any other vertebrates, amply highlight this fact. Some more racophoric frogs. such as uh, Rawar Chistus frogs, right? The, these frogs, again, are also found in parts of Eastern Ghats, and in a global sense, they also stretch into parts of Southeast Asia, Southern China, and in parts of Indochina, we get this Rawar Chistus frogs. The top three rows are uh, Pseudophyllotus, which, as I told you, is a primarily Sri Lankan group of frogs, which are also dispersed into India. 
and then we have the rhacophorids and then we have the endemic genus Gartixalus. So Gartixalus is represented by three species. Most of them are found in high elevation zones, especially in the high elevation forests of uh, Nilgiris and high elevation forests of the Anomaly Mountains. And we have one more species, which is submontane, which is found till the Shankota Gap. This is a very curious and fun frog. This is also a very special frog indeed. It was discovered by professors in the Delhi University and in Belgium. This was named as Nasika Batraka Sahayadrensis in the year 2003. It is quite uh, validly reckoned as the living fossil of Indian amphibians, mainly because of its link with the Seychelles and its very ancient history dating back to the Jurassic Age. This group of frog, this family, is represented by two species, one of which was much more recently described. And <clears throat> these are fossorial frogs, which means they live underground and they dig their uh, way into the surface. During rains, during monsoon, they come out onto land surface and they tend to breed. This is how they look. That on top is the Nasika Batraka Sahayadrensis, mainly present on the windward side of the Western Ghats, that is the Western Slope, whereas the second species, Nasika Batraka Bhupati, is present on the eastern side or the leeward slopes of the Western Ghats. And then we move on to ranids or the typical true frogs. We have several genera such as Indirana, Clinotorsus, and Hydrophylax. The most species rich of all is the Indosilvirana. Formerly, all of them were clumped under one family called Ranidae. Now, uh, Ranidae family has been separated out into several other families, and the genus Rana is no longer represented in India, but it's, it's found in Western Hemisphere, mainly in Europe. Okay, so this is how indo silverana and uh, related genera of frogs look. Most of them look quite similar and were it not for the details or data on their distribution, it's quite hard to identify these frogs. One frog, the bicolored frog, Clinotarsus catipus, is a bit simple to identify. As their name suggests, it has bicolored or two color faces can be seen. And then we have the microglossids. These are the frogs which we typically find in and around our homesteads, right? Frogs which are quite aquatic and frogs which are uh, quite widespread as well. We have a uh, number of groups such as the pond frogs and the cricket frogs, the burrowing frogs, the bullfrog and the green frog. All of them fall under this one family, the microglossidae. Right, so the first two are the pond frogs. The first one is the skipper frog. The second one on the top row is the green frog. So these two are frogs which we commonly get to see in many places in our country, especially in stagnant water bodies. Right, and then we have Minervaria sahyadris, which are which is found in Western Ghats. And then we have two species of Poplobatrachus or the bullfrog. Bullfrogs are quite large uh, sized frogs. Some of them are so large that uh, they even tend to eat small vertebrates as prey. Many are cannibalistic. There are records of bullfrog feeding on another frog, including smaller bullfrogs and including much more dangerous vertebrates such as even snakes have been eaten by the bullfrogs, right? And then we have a, couple, some, a few species of burrowing frogs of the genus Pyrothica, typically short, squat body and uh, uh, stout bill are characteristics of the burrowing frogs. They have enlarged shovel shaped toes and tubercles in their feet, which enables them to dig down under the soil surface. Some more microglossids. 
these are called cricket frogs or paddy field frog the most common species is the minervaria agricola or the indian paddy field frog and then we have some uh, families of frogs which are all endemic to the western ghats right family is microxalidae completely endemic to western ghats family uh, ranixalidae again endemic to western ghats and nictibatrachidae which is found in western ghats as well as in the nearby island of sri lanka microxalids and nictibatrachids these are frogs which are partial to uh, moving water running water like mountain torrents streams and rivulets in western ghats right where we have tropical rainforests and where we have streams running through that that is the place to find these frogs one of them the microxalis has a very curious behavior right it is perhaps one of the few frogs in this region which are diurnal which means it is active during daytime because it lives in a continuously noisy environment it it communicates by sight not by sound unlike other frogs here we have microxalis frogs as i told you most communicate by sight and males of this frog as you can see from the last row the close up picture of the feet during breeding season or the during the nuptial season the males develop a contrasting color in their web which they use to raise their legs and flash their colorful feet to the opponent this has earned the name dancing frogs to them as as to to people size the act of frogs raising their legs and swaying their legs this way and that way flashing their colorful feet looks more or less like a dance some more microxalis frogs there are over 20 species or so of these frogs and some more new species are being described by scientists ranix salad we have two genera in this family one of them is a recently described genus walkerana it's a recently described genus whereas the previous one was indirana usually they have been always called as indirana and uh, recent studies including genetic studies have revealed the existence of one more uh, hidden or cryptic genus of frogs which they have described as walkerana so these frogs again as i told you are endemic to western ghats i'm stressing it again and these are frogs which are semi aquatic they are found not in the water but in and around the peripheries of water bodies the place to find these frogs are in leaf litter wet moist forest floor and leaf litter that is the place where we get to see indirana and then we go on to nictibatrachus nictibatrachus the genus is found as i told you is found only in streams mainly in streams and the nearby habitats these are frogs which are quite used to running or flowing water bodies these are frogs which have a very uh, squat and bulky build some of them are very tiny and some of them are very very large so there is a interesting size gradation in this uh, group of frogs many were described only newly previously we only had uh, a few species 
which were thought to be quite widespread, whereas recent studies, including genetics, have revealed the presence of many cryptic lineages of frogs, including uh, one recently described subfamily called as Astrobatracus, Astrobatracinae, found in parts of Wayanad in North Kerala. So we have had a look at the amphibians and we move on to reptiles. In reptiles, we have several groups, mainly crocodiles, turtles and tortoises put together as group Kelonians, and we have lizards and we have snakes. Again, grouped together as squamate reptiles, right? So what are the features that one should look for in reptiles varies greatly mainly because of the several groupings. Within lizards, we have several families, each posing their own peculiar set of characters for us to identify and choose from, right? We have skinks, we have geckos, we have agamids, we have lacerated lizards, which are quite diverse in Indian Peninsula, and we have some which are species poor, such as the monitor and the chameleon, that are represented by that are represented by just one species each, right? So there is a vast array of characters which we use to identify these animals and we'll be seeing them in subsequent slides. These are geckos. As we all know, these are the familiar wall lizards that we see in our houses, but there are more to geckos than what we get to see in our houses. There are many species, right? Geckos are one of the most primitive and ancient group of lizards. They evolved uh, quite before that of uh, other lizard groups in India. And one genus, Travido gecko, is endemic to Western Ghats. Most geckos are uh, distributed in the Eastern Ghats. Many of them are endemic in mountains in Deccan Plateau, and one species, the Hemidactylus capiceps, is found mainly in the coastal plains along the Coromandel and Carnatic region. So the food of the gecko is quite weird and uh, it has uh, special and unique characters to itself, including the presence of lamellae or small uh, structures on the underside of the feet and toes, which gives them that good grip so as to climb even vertical smooth surfaces. A lot many geckos are found in India. Mainly, they belong to this genus Hemidactylus, which includes the two of the most common species that we get to see in our place. Hemidactylus frenatus, which is the house gecko, and Hemidactylus parvimaculatus, which is the potted uh, gecko. And we have the Hemidactylus rationality, which is the bark gecko, and we have other genera of uh, geckos, which are mainly forest dwelling and mountain dwelling forms, including the Namaspis or day geckos. These are one of the few species of geckos which are active during daytime, whereas most Indian geckos are nocturnal. So day geckos, as their name implies, they have round pupil to indicate their diurnal presence and activity. And these are some of the species of Namaspis or day geckos which are found in Indian mountain ranges such as the Western Ghats and Eastern Ghats. So in India, many more are being discovered and described every now and Okay, uh, we are resuming from where we stopped. Day geckos, genus Namaspis, as I was telling you, quite similar to the Rawarchistus bush frogs. High diversity, high beta diversity, right? Every mountain we climb, we have one species and we cross to the other mountain, we get different species. That is the situation for uh, Namaspis as well. And its systematics is, or uh, classification and naming is yet to be fully worked out by scientists. Many new species have been recently described, including from the Eastern Ghats and mountains in the Deccan Plateau and as well as parts of North and Western Ghats. Some more genera of geckos.
we have gehaira which is typically an uh, australian and indonesian uh, uh, radiation of geckos and we have cetodactylus a predominantly southeast asian radiation of geckos and we have the hemiphylodactylus to in the in the second row which again is a southeast asian genus of geckos and we have the beautiful golden gecko or uh, calodactylodus which is a predominantly african related to african lineage of geckos many of these uh, genera have undergone uh, recent taxonomic changes and uh, probably this uh, this this whole naming and classification is yet to reach much clarity as regards geckos particularly true to cetodactylus and hemiphylodactylus geckos and we have agamid lizards the next family of lizards that we are going to look at are the agamids these are called as the dragon lizards or the garden lizards and we have the spectacular flying lizard or the gliding lizard draco is a part of this family of lizards that a part what we get to see in our backyards and home gardens is the common garden lizard calotes versicolor is again a part of this family of lizards right and we have lots of endemic species as usual from the western ghats including genera such as uh, monilsaurus which is recently described microaurus again which is recently described and some more widespread species such as the smaller terrestrial lizards like sitana and the recently described genus sarna and we have the genus autocryptis which is peculiar to southern india and sri lanka we have two species in ceylon and we have species here in southern part of india in the western ghats most of these can be identified by counting the rows of scales and by looking at their crest particularly one important feature in the family agamids are the sexual dimorphism right several features are quite uh, dimorphic that is they look apart when when we see a mature male and a mature female we can easily distinguish their gender such is their appearance most males have a swollen cheek and a well uh, elaborate and ornamented uh, uh, skin features including the crest or the pular pouch or the throat fan these are features which are secondary sexual characters and males use them to advertise their presence to other adversary males or in uh courtship displays this slide is to show you a glimpse of how uh, most uh, agamid lizards look like in india the first row is the monilsaurus western ghats uh, typical western ghats and characteristic uh, lizards one species roxy now uh, monilsaurus roxy previously called as calotus roxy this is also found in parts of eastern ghats and isolated hills in the deccan and then we have the genus calotes in the second row calotes nemoricola calotes grandis squamis species endemic to western ghats and in the middle we have calotus calotes which is found pretty much in the far south of india in tamil nadu and kerala and also in sri lanka in the last row we have uh draco in the in the left that is the flying lizard or the gliding lizard as i told you it cannot fly in the sense of a bird but it can glide that is descend in height from a higher perch to a lower perch by aerial descent much like a parachute how it glides so that is the same principle in which the gliding lizard glides down to right this species is found in parts of western ghats and we have reports of similar looking populations from eastern ghats as well and then in the last row we have two species of mountain lizards called salia which uh, occur only in the high elevation solar forests one species in the nilgiris and one species in the anamalai and palni hills salia horsfieldi in the nilgiris and salia anamaliana in the anamalai and palni ranges also in the high wavy mountains present for the south these are the smaller terrestrial lizards that i was talking about sitana what is called as fan rooted lizard of now we have lots of new descriptions and discoveries in this group as well 
and we have the autocryptis which is found in southern part of western ghats as well as in sri lanka autocryptis betomi one species is found in parts of tirunelveli tiruvananthapuram and kanyakumari hills and we have one endemic genus in peninsular india called as the samophilus or rock lizards these are lizards which are partial to rocky habitats how much ever uh, hard we look we need to go to places which have rocky boulders to sight this species quite uh, flamboyantly colored particularly males in during the breeding season the bottom row as you can see from the one to the right is a picture showing you the male and to the left is a picture showing the female or a subadult right so mature individuals during nuptial coloration develop that uh, kind of contrasting colors like red and black which they sport to advertise their presence whereas normally they are quite sober and camouflagingly colored very fast moving agile and acrobatic lizards the next family are skinks smooth and shiny scaled lizards found in uh, many habitats right from the coast all the way till mountain tops we have skinks living in several parts of india and the most common and diverse genus is the eutropis which was previously called as mabuya now it is to be called as eutropis right and we have two species of dacia that are tree skinks arboreal or tree dwelling forms which are endemic to western ghats we have small uh, skinks with elongated body and reduced limbs such as those of the genera rhyopa and subdolisops and we have a group of skinks called caesclia which again is found mainly in western ghats of late uh, it has been found in the eastern ghats as well and we have the ristella or cat skinks so called because of their retractile claws which is the unique feature of this group of skinks ristella is sometimes called as in its own family ristellidae sometimes people name it as a sub family as ristellinae and their closest relatives are found in sri lanka we have spinomorphus in parts of kerala and karnataka and we have calcinus and in the northern and eastern parts of indian peninsula in parts of andhra pradesh and orissa we have two genera of limbus lizards ஜெனரா <laughs> the sapsophis which is predominantly found in the mountain forests and the barkudia which is represented by two species found in the coastal scrub belts one near the chilka lake and one further south in parts of visakhapatnam and andhra pradesh right this is to show you a glimpse of the skink diversity in our country we have uh, the alapalli skink the tropis macularia complex the bedom skink and we have the eutropis clavicola which is uh, from south kerala and parts of southern karnataka as well and we have eutropis nagarjunensis which is found in eastern ghats one of the few skinks which is found in parts of nallamalai mountains in andhra pradesh state and we have the eutropis vibronii which is found along the coasts barring a few inland locality records and we have the rhyopa skinks which are uh, small and limb reduced forms with shiny smooth scales previously they were called as under the genus ligosoma last year we have we have a publication which split this genus into several genera these are further skinks some more species spinomorphus found in parts of kerala and southern karnataka and we have ristella ristella rooki found in high elevation anamalai forest ristella travancorica mountains and we have a uh, ristella gantari which again occurs in parts of madura hills and we have ristella bedomi which has been reported all the way from jog falls to kalyakumari mountains we have the genus caesclia 
kings of the genus Caestia. Kings of the genus Caestia are easily identified by the bluish tinge on their tail tips, particularly young in young ones and as adults in the underside. So the subcaudal or underside of the tail of the genus Caestia are typically sky blue in coloration. If you see the last row of the picture, the, the middle, the, the photo in the middle, it shows a young Caestia lizard with distinctively bluish tail tip. Right? Now we, we move on to lacerated lizards. Lacertids are quite related to skinks, but they are uh, different from skinks quite externally. They have much more keeled scales, much uh, uh, well-developed limbs, uh, and they are lizards which are found in some grassy and rocky biomes. These are fast-moving diurnal lizards. Most of them are insectivorous and egg-laying forms. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, there is an option in near participants. Uh, please admit also. Some of the uh, participants are waiting to enter into the layout. Uh, you click the participants at the, at the top, uh, you will see, see some uh, admit all. Okay. Sir, have you Yes, I'm continuing. Okay, okay, okay. Sir. Continue, sir. Continue, sir. Continue, sir. Right. So this is to show you what the what our lacertids look like. They are sober brown colored lizards, which are small in size with some stripes. And they are, as I told you, these are lizards that are typically rocky habitats and grassy habitats. They like open landscapes, not that much a lizard of uh, thickly vegetated areas. They do not occur in much vegetated areas, but are lizards found in flat open land, right? And then we have the chameleons and we have the monitor lizards. Both these families of lizards are represented by one species each, the South Asian chameleon and the Indian monitor lizard. As we all know, chameleons have many peculiarities such as ability to change the skin color and their, their eyes which, which can rotate and see in 360 degrees independently, their prehensile tail and their arms. Monitor lizards are also quite unique in the sense Excuse me, participant, please unmute yourself. Mute yourself, please. Okay. We also get some. Sir, Ganeshan, sir, Ganesh, sir, dropping, sir. Sir, mute, unmute, all, sir. The below is the option. <laughs> Okay, sir, I'm now continuing. Okay, sir, okay, sir, okay, sir. So, some features such as the head shape and the body shape and the shape of the tail can also be a good clue or indicator for us to identify what species of snake we are looking at. For example, the shield tail snakes are mainly burrowing snakes, which have a short and cylindrical body, whereas the sea snakes are quite aquatic, 100% aquatic in marine snakes. These are snakes which are helpless on land. They cannot move as much as on land as on sea snakes, right? So the sea snakes have developed a paddle-shaped or O-shaped tail. That is a very unique feature that identifies sea snakes. And we have some species such as the pit vipers and pythons that come with thermoreceptor sites or 
heat sensing fits. It is present in the facial region of the snake, in the loreal, that is between the eye and nostril, or along the lips, in the case of the pythons. First one here is the worm snake. Quite small, smooth scale, and uh, the head and tail looks quite similar. These are burrowing snakes, which many of us get to see in our gardens when we dig down to pot plants, right? Uh, worm snakes. The unique feature about this group is one species, the common worm snake, is parthenogenetic. That is, it is known only from an all-female population. There is no known male documented for this species, and it reproduces asexually. And we have uh, other groups of snakes, such as the pythons and sand boas. Erisidae, which means sand boas, and pythonidae contains pythons. These are constrictors, which means they are non-venomous, and they physically wrap around and overpower their prey to kill their prey, which they eat subsequently. This is to show you some uh, live images of uh, worm snakes, rare species, different species of worm snakes, and that of the Indian python, and the three species of sand boa in the last row. We have the common sand boa, the red sand boa, and the vertical boa. The last one is endemic to Western Ghats, whereas the other two are quite widespread throughout the country. The Indian python is a threatened species of snake. Previously, it has been hunted by people in the past, which, is, which has made them an endangered species of snake. And it is, it is now enjoying a legal and statutory protection by law. And then we move on to the next family of snakes, the shield tail snakes or Europeltids. These are snakes uh, which are quite remarkable. And uh, the whole family are found only in the Indian Peninsula, only in parts of southern and central India and in the island of Sri Lanka. Nowhere else is this whole family of snakes represented geographically. It's found only in South Asia, only in these two countries. And it is also highly diverse. We have several dozens of species, mostly in the genus Europeltis and in the genus Rhinophis in Sri Lanka. These are snakes which are so-called because of their uh, peculiar shaped tails. These are burrowing snakes, small snakes that are, that are barely about a foot in length. And these are species which are quite little known, right? We do not know much about their habits or natural history. All we know that they feed on earthworms and they live in mountain forests and they live mainly under soil or under the rocks or fallen logs and humus rich surfaces. During nights, they have been seen to crawl onto the road surface or the land surface and forage for food. So this is the uh, this is how the tail shield looks like. As you can see from the picture, their head and tail are more or less the same in shape and size. And they come in a few different colors. Like I told about the namaspis, like I told about the raw sisters frogs, the bush frogs, recollect those texts. So quite similarly, these shield tail snakes are also species which are quite unique and locally endemic. That is, there is a lot of beta diversity in this group of snakes. One mountain where we stand, we dig down, we get a, a series of species. When we crawl down the valley and when we go to the, when we ascend on to the next hill, we get to see a different assemblage of Europe, a different set of species, which do not occur in the nearby hill, right? So that is how their diversity is structured and patterned across a gradient of mountain ranges. Some more species of Europeltids. The previous slide showed you those of the genus Europeltis, whereas the current slide shows you pictures of snakes of the genus Rhinophis, Plecterus in the first row, and in the second row, the Brachiophidium or Teratrus, and we have Platyplecterus, and we have Melanophidium, the fully black looking snake. So all these species of uh, genera of snakes are uh, quite uh, rare when compared to the Europe species. One species, the Plecterus perotati, it's found in England around Uti and parts of Upper Nilgiris, is reasonably common there, but it's quite range restricted. 
many species of seal tails are threatened by human activities including climate change and a lot of road kills and threats such as uh, conversion of forest to plantations uh, and uh, monoculture crops. Family Viperidae. Now we are dealing with snakes which are venomous. Vipers are venomous snakes and they can be instantly identified by their flat triangular head. We have a couple of genera of uh, vipers, true vipers and uh, two, two more genera of pit vipers. The hump nose pit viper genus Hypnail and the uh, other groups of pit viper fall under the genus Trimericerus. And we have two common widespread species of true vipers known as the Russell's viper, that is Daboya russelli, and the soft scale viper, which is Carinatus. We also have one very enigmatic viper that is known from one place called the Meghamalai Mountains near Madurai, and this is called as the Hutton Spit Viper. It is still quite a mysterious snake because nobody has seen it uh, subsequent to its description, and many efforts by scientists have not yielded with the second sighting of the species. This is to show you some uh, images of vipers. The first one is the Russells, the second one is the saw scale, and then comes all the pit vipers. Some of the green forms are arboreal, that is they live on plants and trees, like the large scale pit viper, whereas the brown or multicolored ones, like the hump nose pit viper or the horseshoe pit viper are terrestrial forms, which are found in uh, evergreen forests. And then we have one uh, very unique family of snakes called the Acrocordidae. This is called as the elephant trunk snake or the ward snake. A very peculiar snake, which has, of course, I have to tell you first that it's a marine snake. It lives in coastlines and shorelines. It, it occurs sympathetically with sea snakes and some homolapsed snakes such as dogfish water snakes, right? So this species is non-venomous and it is one of the few snakes in the marine environment which has a tail that is similar to any other snake, same. A long and tapering tail is present in the acrocorded snakes, right? We have one species that is found in most of the coastal lines, mainland and island coast of India. Though it is widespread, it is nowhere commonly to be seen. Then we have Pariate Day or Pari Day a genus of snakes known as Xylophis. Okay, Paridae, that is a genus of snakes known as Xylophis are found in forests of Western Ghats. Some new species have been described recently. And these are species which Although related to water snakes are not quite uh, aquatic, although related to snail eating snakes, previously we have been uh, of opinion that they are related to aquatic snakes, but that was not the case. Recent studies have shown them to be related to snakes, which are called as the snail eating snakes. Right. These are xylophis species, which are found in mainly in the evergreen rainforests of Western Ghats both in the high elevations as well as in the lowlands. These are called as keelback snakes, the typical water snakes or aquatic snakes of India. And a few genera are known, including uh, Faulia, the checkered keelback, Amphiasma, the striped keelback, Atritium cystosum, the olive keelback, and Hebeus species, such as Hebeus bedomi, Hebeus monticola, both of which are endemic to the Western Ghats, right? So this group again was uh, the classification and naming has been recently revised, but still a lot of genetic work is pending on the Indian keelback snakes. This is to show you a glimpse of what uh, Indian keelback snakes look like. This also includes one uh, family, one uh, genus of snakes known as Rabdops, Rabdops olivaceus, and one more recently described species now occurs in northern parts of Western Ghats.
They have rear fangs and coccyx saliva, but they are not venomous like in the usual sense of term. That is, they are not venomous like a cobra or a viper. They do not have front fangs or hollow teeth, but they have but they have rear fangs and mildly toxic saliva. And then we move on to elapids, which is the family of snakes that contain uh, some of the most venomous snakes, such as the crates, such as coral snakes, cobras, sea snakes, and king cobras. So this is to show you some of the elapids found in India, the common crate and the coral snakes in the first two rows and in the third row as well. In the final row, we have the Indian cobra, Naja Naja, which is a widespread and common species of snake. And we also have the king cobra or Ophiophagus hana. In India, king cobras are not found throughout the country, but are restricted to the Western Ghats and to parts of Northern and Eastern Peninsula India in places like uh, Bitter Kanika mangroves, in places like uh, uh, Northern Eastern Ghats, in Vishagapatnam, in Papikonda, in those places. That's the place where we have king cobras. This is within the Indian Peninsula. Outside of this region, they are quite widespread. There we have king cobras that, that's found all the way till Philippines through the South and Southeast Asia. Some unique features about the king cobra is it's cannibalistic. It is Ophiophagus, that is, which means it, it feeds on snakes, including other venomous snakes, including other king cobras, right? This is also one of the only snakes known to build a nest. During the nesting season, a female, when, it, when it's supposed to lay eggs, it piles up a, a, a heap of leaves that is found on the forest floor. It piles up all the leaves together by its body coils and it amasses a bunch of leaf litter and it lays its eggs inside and it makes a watch over it for a few weeks or months. The next group is the sea snakes. As I told you before, elapid snakes also include sea snakes. Previously, they have been considered of their own, uh, to belong to their own family hydrophidae, but recent genetic studies have revealed that they are part of a terrestrial radiation of snakes like um, Australian venomous snakes of the family Elapidae. Okay, sea snakes, there are 20 or so species found throughout Indian coastlines as a few of them are widespread. Some of them are quite range restricted or rare snakes, right? Sea snakes are no different from land snakes. They also respire through lungs. They are also air breathing animals. They do not take in dissolved oxygen like fishes, right? And these are extremely venomous species which have highly potent venom to subdue and paralyze the fish that they eat. As I told you before, tails of sea snakes are shaped like a paddle or oar for easy swimming and they are not that efficient movers on land. All sea snakes give birth to live young like the sand boas or like the shield tail snakes that we discussed previously Sea snakes are also live wearing snakes like vipers, whereas some groups like the sea crates are egg laying forms. This is to show you how the sea snakes look like in life. The first uh, row also shows you a picture of the close up of the tail. That's how their tails look. And most species are more or less superficially similar and takes a scale count to identify them. Whereas one species, the black and yellow sea snake, Hydrophis platyrus, can be recognized uh, well because of its characteristic body color. And then we move on to colubrids, right? Boiga, we discussed about the cat snake earlier. And then we have the ahitula or the tree snakes, the green whip snakes. And then we have racers and trinkets like what is shown in this picture. The rat snake is also part of the colubridae family. These are some colubrid examples for you. Rat snake, one of the most common snakes found in India. 
the third longest of all Indian snake, next to pythons and king cobras, it is the rat snakes. They are harmless snakes, although they may be quite uh, big and intimidating. They are quite beneficial to people indeed, right? Many call them as friends of farmers because of the invaluable service rat snakes lend to us by keeping a check on rat and rodent population. Rats are not their exclusive prey, but they, their staple prey is rats. They also feed on a vast array of other animals, including small birds, including amphibians, small reptiles like lizards, and sometimes maybe even snakes. And then we have racers like the uh, Nagarjun Sagar racer, the banded racer, and then we have trinket snakes, and then we have other snakes which are related to colubrids like the Lyopeltis or the uh, striped necked snake that is there in the middle bottom picture shows you Lyopeltis calamaria which is known as the reed snake or striped neck snake. And then we have wolf snakes and bridal snakes which are all colubrids like this group of snakes called as the lycodon or wolf snakes. These are small non-venomous snakes often mistaken for crates because of their banded pattern and get killed by people. And then we have kukri snakes, which can be easily identified by their typical characteristic arrow-shaped marking on their foreheads. This is to show you some tree snakes, bronze backs, and wine snakes. Wine snakes have horizontal pupil, like lack of forehead frogs, right? As you can see from the Bottom picture, it shows you a close-up of the head of a wine snake with horizontal pupil, horizontally elliptical pupil that instantly identifies wine snake. The parroty green color is also an important identification feature. Not many snakes are that, that very green and arboreal like a wine snake. Maybe a few pit vipers or the green peel bags, but they have other bodily differences and they are not as slender and elongate body as the green wine snake. Okay, so we are kind of drawing to a close. Now we have had a look at the various, various families of frogs, of lizards, and of snakes. Now, if we want to identify any of these taxa, what we need to do is to note down the characters, that is their external morphological characters, and carefully compare it with field guides like what is shown in this slide. We have a lot many books uh, that are that are available as recent field guides. I'm just using this to show you what it is like to have a key. We have something called as a taxonomic key or a dichotomous key, which gives us a set of characters based on which if we compare and contrast the morphological details of our specimen at hand and what is given in the book, that is the best way to try to identify a snake or a lizard by narrowing down all the options and omitting one by one. That will take us to the exact species or genus of what we are looking at. Of late, there have been uh, other, bar other techniques such as DNA barcoding, which has also greatly improved our understanding of classification of reptiles and amphibians. This has also resulted in a large number of discovery of new species of reptiles and amphibians from India. As I told you at the very beginning, beginning of this talk, the year 2000 and afterwards, that is this century, has been a good turning point for Indian herpetology as a lot of new species of reptiles and amphibians have been discovered and described by scientists recently. So what are the threats that this, these animals are facing? A lot of threats. Mainly I'm going to categorize into two types, the direct threats and the indirect threats. Indirectly, many face threats such as habitat loss and deformities. Especially this is true for amphibians. We all know about the chytrid fungal disease that has caught the amphibians worldwide, including in parts of India. It, this has resulted in large-scale deformities and malformation in amphibians, like what is portrayed in this slide. 
right? As we can see from the top row pictures, lots of deforestation and habitat transformation will give them or rob them of their uh, native habitat. And what we give them in return is a very suboptimal or uh, semi-suitable habitat, which is not that ideal for reptiles or amphibians. And we also have some direct threats direct threats, not an indirect threat like climate change or habitat loss, but much more direct, road kills, and even worse is wanton killings. Everybody is scared of snakes, and uh, this set of very grievous and shocking images tell you, like, what is the consequence of people killing snakes, right? Many harmless species of snakes, non-venomous species of snakes are mistaken for venomous species and indiscriminately killed by people out of fear. So knowledge is the best weapon to deal with this problem, right? We just need to understand which species are venomous and which species are not. Just because a snake is venomous doesn't mean it has to be killed, but there are ways, very simple and very effective, by, by which we can uh, quite amicably cohabit with snakes. And please keep in mind, we cannot avoid snakes. We can very well avoid snake bites. Right? These are two distinct things. Presence of snake may be a chance for snake bite, but that doesn't mean we will always get bitten by snakes. Right? Snake bite, again, is quite a misunderstood topic that doesn't form a core part of this, this particular talk, but just to touch upon some aspects, we always have a very reliable and safe cure and remedy for snake bite. Go to the government hospital and get admitted take the antivenom serum treatment and that will save lives. So the purpose of doing research on herpetofauna, much similar to other wildlife research, is of two kinds. To, to do research, both in situ and ex situ research are possible. And one case is with the flagship species like the king cobra, with which I have uh, in the past been acquainted with and recent researches have including the radio telemetry research done in parts of Western Ghats and it's now been initiated in parts of Thailand and Southeast Asia as well. It has showed us how little we have known about even some of the most iconic snakes of our country. If this is the case of, of, of uh, snakes with high public profile, think about the myriad other herpetofauna like small lizards and unassuming frogs and other tiny snakes. We virtually do not know much about any of these species. And there is vast scope for studies in Indian herpetology still to come. I think with this, I am kind of drawing the session to a close. I'll be happy to take questions if any from the participants. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Welcome. Uh, Ganesh, sir, I have a question, sir. Please tell me, sir. Uh, uh, sir, if uh, in the Nam uh, India like that, the exclusive egg eating snakes, sir. Uh, exclusive egg eating snakes. Yes, we do have.